And we are moving forward with that. Thank you very much. And uh, we are good. There's something else here that I need to tell you about. I just don't, I don't remember. It's old age, right? I don't know what it is, but that's okay. Oh, this is it. It's important. Um, Leo and Melody's grandson, 13-year-old Joshua, was in a very severe uh, accident last night and burned. Uh, he has burns on his arms and chest and torso and legs, I believe. And, he's at, and his face as well, Leo. He's in the burn unit up at Fresno, and uh, Melody is there today, and so we just need to, uh, let's take a moment, and let's just lift up family today and uh, pray for young Joshua, all right? Father God, may your presence envelop that place. May your hand be upon uh, all of those burns, and Lord, you are the master healer. You are our creator, you are our healer. And in Jesus' name, that you would touch his body. Be with family. But just comfort them and love on them today. And may God, to all the glory, be yours. We pray this. We believe it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There we go. All right, you may be wondering what I'm doing with this. Well, um, I'm a hockey fan. And, and my son Bryce had no chance to, uh, to be a hockey fan I made him be one, and uh, while well, kids were playing soccer, and um, you know, uh, I, I can't remember what they called that little football league, I can, whatever that was called, Jack Sprouts or something, I can't remember what it was called, anyway, Pop Warner, there we go, Jack Sprouts, same thing, and um, you know, all that stuff, I signed him up for hockey, and, and, and hockey's a great game, and it, it's, it's a lot of fun. But the thing about hockey is it's kind of dangerous. And, and you've got to have the, the right stuff to be, to be able to play. And, and, and I remember that when we bought this helmet for Bryce, he was going to be going out for his first practices. You were not allowed on the ice unless you had a helmet, and a bike helmet would not suffice. You had to have a full shield, like I'm wearing here, a cage, and the helmet, and I remember when we brought this home and gave it to him, he was so excited about this helmet, he immediately put it on. And he just wore it. And he wore it. And he wore it. And folks, it is the type of material that just gets sweaty and grimy and gross, but he continued to wear it. And wear it. And later that afternoon when he went out to go ride his bike, guess what? He wore his helmet. As a matter of fact, we never bought Bryce a bike helmet. This became his de facto uh, bike helmet for years. And so inspiring was this hockey helmet was that our neighbor kid, uh, Amy, her dad went out and bought, because she was klutzy and she was cute, and dad went out and bought her a full cage hockey helmet for her bike helmet. And she probably still wears it to this day. But what just made it really fun for us when it was time for bed, he would not take it off. <laughs> he wore it to bed. Chin straps and all on, and he slept in the hockey helmet all night long. And what I love about that story is this, that if we are going to do something, we have to be not only ready, but we need to be equipped. And folks, in the church... Not only do we need to be ready for what God is doing, we need to be equipped to be moved and to be used of God when He calls on us. I love the fact that over these last several weeks, we have been looking at um, this, this theme of the Holy Spirit. And, and many of you, when I, when I said I'm going to be teaching on the Holy Spirit, some of you had a preconceived idea of what that was going to be about. Perhaps you grew up in, a, in, a, in an Assembly of God church or a Pentecostal church that, um, you know, anytime you talked about the Holy Spirit, we kind of pigeonholed it into one thing. That meant, okay, the Holy Spirit, that means that you got to pray in the Spirit or pray in tongues, and then that's it. And just do that and just get filled with the Holy Spirit in that way, and then you're good to go. And that's kind of the pigeonholing of the, this idea of the Holy Spirit. And that's why uh, over several weeks I've been talking to you about everything about the Holy Spirit but that. And the longer it went on, I even had someone say to me the other day, now, 
Now, you are Pentecostal, right? Because they were concerned because I wasn't talking about the experience of this, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And they were concerned because they thought maybe I'd lost something from my roots and everything else. But folks, I got to tell you that there is something very, very powerful when we combine understanding and when we begin to understand the larger picture of who the Holy Spirit is and what He wants to do in our lives, and then we combine that with what I feel is a normative pattern of Scripture, and we have this opportunity to experience the Holy Spirit in a powerful way. Now, I, I had several... Uh, meetings out of town this week and someone asked uh, and anytime you get together with a bunch of pastors pastors are the worst ones they always want to talk about church can't they talk about family or the football game? but they always want to talk about church because they always want to talk about I don't know something that they're doing and everything else and so I'm always kind of coy when they ask and 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 one of the guys said so how Jeff how's the church going and and that can be a that can sometimes be a hard question because you know, the church is more than just one idea or one thing. And the church is, a, is this, is this uh, you know, it's like an organism that just grows and it, and it continues to be that. It's to be shaped by what the Holy Spirit is directing and guiding in our lives. And so, you know, my standard answer is it's going pretty good. And, and then I, I kind of added a little bit. I said, you know, we're, we, we've got some very aggressive or big dreams this year. But my final part of it was, but we are going to need the power of God to see it through. And he kind of looked at me and said, well, that is what we believe, right? I said, it's what we believe, but we don't teach anymore. And he said, yeah, it's true. You see, folks, in many ways, we have done this to ourselves. We have, uh, we have what we call a distinctive. And it's been something that's been around with us for over a hundred years now. And yet, there is less passion around this idea of the, of the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues than perhaps any time in our Pentecostal history here in the United States. Now, if you were to go to South America today, they are on fire for the things of the Holy Spirit. If you were to go to regions of Africa today, they are on fire. If you were to go to areas of Australia today, they are on fire in regards to the things of the Holy Spirit. And yet, the place where we're not really on fire with the things of the Spirit is right here. And I think, I think what's happened is we've just tied, and it's natural, it's, it's, it just happens, but we've just, we just kind of have our priorities or our, our living emotions and state of mind, I think we squarely have those ahead of the things and the priorities of God. And because of that, there is, uh, there's something that happens in our life or there's something that is diminished in our lives. As we, um, as we don't necessarily live for God first, but we live for self and then we include God in everything that we are doing. You see... Well, let's take, the, let's take the crisis of the last five years, and that now is, is I, I think, better. Uh, but five years ago, or in five years of being your pastor, there was, um, I'm just going to be transparent here this morning, there was a significant uh, financial issue that had to be resolved. And in, and in moments in that, there was genuine crisis. And there would be some Sundays where I stood here and said, well, folks, here is the deal. We're going we're gonna to need approximately this amount of money this week. And, and that was never a fun thing, but I always wanted to be honest with you about where we are and how it's all going together and everything else. And there was moments of crisis. And then you combine the moments of crisis that has happened corporately within our body to what is going on in many of the lives of the people that live through this valley. In, 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 it, it is lessened, but people are still still tr struggling with foreclosures or bankruptcies or, or just kind of digging themselves out from the, the hole that was created in, in, in the real estate meltdown and everything else. And there was just a, there was a lot of hurt going on in people's lives. And, 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 I, and, and to, to your credit, what I thought was absolutely amazing is that many of you recognize that your hope comes from the Lord. And, as you're, and, and you became desperate, and you started to say things like this, well, unless God just does something, then I don't know how it's going to happen. And in many ways, God did do things. 
And we experienced in the, in, in, in the fall, and that, this miracle continues today, when we, we taught the Blessed Life series, and many of you took a challenge for 90 days to come alongside and corporately join us, and we saw a miraculous turnaround in our church finances in the last quarter of last year, and that is still blessing and moving and operating today. Praise the Lord, it's fantastic. And at the same time, I am blown away at the fact or the, the testimonies that still cross my desk about what God is doing in your lives as you have, as, as you have taken on this stance to, to follow the Lord and be obedient and to give and, and, and all that. And, I, and I'm just thrilled. But here's what's so interesting. And I just, this is a pastoral perspective today. But I just have to share it with you because I would not be your pastor if I didn't share this. But I just believe that the better our situation gets in life, that there's a little bit of lethargy that enters our worship. You see, for many of you, your situation has improved, and you no longer are petitioning the Lord for your daily bread. And now you kind of live out of the sense, well, it's just going to be there. And there is something that has begun to creep in. And, and this, is, this is absolutely natural. This is what we do when we go into a, a time of crisis. And then when we're coming out of it, there is, there's, um, you know, there's, we begin to relax because the pressure is off. But I want to challenge you today that you and I don't have time to relax. That you and I need to continue to engage about the spirit of on us and that's what I want to talk to you so financially we're doing well financially many of you are doing well but spiritually perhaps a jolt is in order now I'm not alluding or suggesting that we're dead nor even lukewarm but I do believe our focus needs to be dialed in now this is uh this has been exemplified for us in our youth department this past year and I am just so not only proud of Nick and Jessica as leaders and all those that come alongside, but I am proud of our students. You know, sometimes our students drive us crazy. Anyone say amen to that? That's right. Sometimes they're just, if there was a cliff, we would want to push in some cases, right? And, and, and sometimes they will just drive us insane. Uh, they, they, they don't wear sleeves when they're doing announcements. Uh, they, uh, you know, they, 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 they play drums too loud. I'm picking on the DeBolt family so far. Let's go somewhere else. Uh, no, they just, you know, they bring hockey helmets to bed and stuff, and they just do weird stuff. But I love what is happening in the lives of our students because they have picked up on something that absolutely needs to be engaged, not just in our youth ministries area, but needs to be engaged in the way we do and practice and live in this organism of the church. And they recognize that there just needs to be a hunger in their lives to see people come to Jesus. And so I remember back some months ago, it was probably August or September, Nick kind of, and it was, I think it was a little bit sheepish at first to say this, but he said, I am believing for 100 students to come to the Lord this year. 100 students! Folks, that's bigger than 95% of the churches that will join together today in the United States. Most churches are 70 or under. And he's believing this crazy dream that God wants to save 100 students in their ministry this year. Okay, so you know what's crazy about this? God does it! To date, we're not even done this year. 134 students have come to the Lord this year. That gives me goosebumps, frankly. Because that sounds so New Testament. It sounds so much like what the church is supposed to be about. And you couple that with the fact that, that, that God is calling to ministry some of these students. And that many of them, okay, and here's the kicker. You see, kids and students, they're not afraid to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. It's in these rooms, in these adult circles that we go, yeah, but, but, yep, but, 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 all these little objections go up and we have all kinds of reasons why this should be or shouldn't be and everything else. But the students go, hmm, I need that. 
And many of them have been filled with the Holy Spirit this year, and God is doing remarkable stuff in their lives. And that is the fruit of understanding that, that this is not just about doing church, but we have a mission. We have a purpose for which we've been called to fulfill. In the same meeting that I was sitting in this past week, uh, a, a friend posed this question. And it's something, I, to be honest, I'd never thought about before. But he said to the room, he said, what two things are we not going to be doing in heaven? And my first thought was not answering this question. That's for sure, right? I'm always a little sarcastic and a little quick sometimes with the quip. And I shouldn't be that way, but sometimes I am. And so I, I never thought about the question, frankly, because I'd always thought about what would be better in heaven. Right? Isn't that what you think? I mean, I'm going to have these little wings. I'm going to float around. I'm not so sure about the white diaper thing, but the bow and arrow thing, that excites me. I'm all over that. <laughs> Got to lose a little more weight so it looks right. Don't want to be pudgy in the diaper in heaven, I can tell you that. Just, that's just the way it is. No, I think about heaven, and I, and I, I think that our, our worship will be awesome. No one in heaven will complain about how loud the music is. No one in heaven will complain about how short the sermon was. No one ever complains about that. Sorry. No one ever says, you just spoke too short today, Pastor. Ah. I, I mean, the neighborhoods are going to look good. They're going to have to. Streets of gold. I mean, that's... That's an improvement on your block, isn't it? Um, no, I never really thought about what, what we wouldn't be doing in heaven. And he said, there's two things that we're not going to be doing in, in, in heaven. Huh. And it's missions and evangelism. And it hit me like a just... Whoa! And the reason is, that's our responsibility now. That is the spirit-enabled responsibility that you and I are to grab onto. And you know what the thing that scares the most, or scares people the most in the body of Christ? It's actually talking to somebody else about Christ. That scares and makes so many people just nervous that they go, just give me a class. Give me a class. Okay, I graduated from the class. Give me another class. We're always trying to, you know, get all this stuff. We're looking for somehow to get this out. And i got to tell you, it's not that hard. That provision for us has been made. And it is the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how this gets done in a powerful way, in a God-ordained way, and in a way that sees the mission of the church go forward in power. Now, this is where I get to be maybe overly simplistic. But I believe that as you and I read the book of Acts, we're not just reading a narrative or a story of history. You and I are reading our story. The story of the church today and how it is to move in the power of God. And you're going, oh, well, okay, i got to think about Acts. Isn't that where they killed two people that lied about the, yes, it was. Are you saying, I say, I'm not saying anything, I'm just telling you today that how the power of the Holy Spirit moves, it creates a readiness in our lives, it equips us in our lives to do and to believe big dreams because He enables it by His power. Now, how many of you have been raised in a Pentecost or an Assembly of God church? Let's see your hands. That's the first time many of you have raised your hands in church in about a year. Congratulations. Now, I had to pick on you a little bit. Raise your hands again real quick. So about half of you have an understanding of what I'm talking about today. Are you, you have experience or history with what we call this, this Pentecostal distinctive, and, and you kind of get what I'm talking about. And I want to challenge you today first that you see there is something that that we have been blessed with and have been given. And i got to tell you, I believe we have mishandled it. We made it all about what should happen at an altar, but we did not apply it to what needs to happen in going into all the world. 
And we just said, if this happens here on a Sunday, and we get the ooey gooeys, and we get the goosebumps, and maybe the service gets a little bit loud, it's Irish dancers, you know, and all that stuff, you know. Is that what they're going to do, kind of this thing, you know? I will come and anoint the building before the Irish dancers come. And I'm not sure. Anyways, you don't want to get... Um, Pentecostals in the room. Let me ask you, don't answer the question out loud. For all my Pentecostal friends in the room, don't answer out loud. When was the last time you prayed in the Spirit? When was the last time you prayed in the Spirit during your work week or your school week or in your coming and your going and in your driving and your wherever you were called to go? You see, When you read our story out of the book of Acts, recognize that the Holy Spirit, the power of that outpouring is not necessarily happening in the synagogue region. It is happening in houses. It's happening in neighborhoods. It's happening in people groups. It's happening with people that have have yet to hear and yet they're hearing the message and they are... They are filled with the Holy Spirit and there's this evidence and this is why uh, some denominations disagree with us but the the Assemblies of God teach us that there's evidence of the Holy Spirit's outpouring when we pray in this other tongue or in this other language. Now some people go, you know what, we just don't want to talk about it anymore because it just sounds odd. Yeah, I know it does sound odd, frankly. But if I don't talk about it, I am missing large portions of Scripture that I would never, ever share with you. Now, I'm not saying that everybody in this room is going to say, I want to be Pentecostal. I'm not saying that either. But what I'm telling you is that I believe that we have some great dreams that God wants to move us into. And the only way I see it happening is if we are equipped with the fire of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that's what I'm trying to tell you today. The only ones saying yes are the Pentecostals in the room. That's right. Okay, so one of these aggressive goals that we have this year is that, um, and you've been hearing uh, us say a lot about it, is that we want to be the friendliest place on earth. Now folks, that only happens because we will begin to love people. Matthew twenty two thirty seven through 39 says this, Jesus said, love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. So this is a great, what I call, anchoring verse. This is, what, this is a foundational verse in our lives that we all need to know. That the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord with totality, with everything we have. That's an anchoring verse. We all, can, we all need to do that, and we can all agree that's what God's Word is saying. Now here's the second part here. It says, and the second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. And some are immediately going, but have you met my neighbor's? How many of you have a challenging neighbor? How many of you are the challenging neighbor? (laughs) Chuck was the first to raise his hand. Thank you for the honesty this morning, Chuck. (laughs) You know, there was was an amen that went across the room when you raised your hand, Chuck. (laughs) Amen. Praise the Lord. Praying for Chuck. You and I are called not to just love the physical person that's living in the home next to us on either side behind us and across the street. You and I are called to love the person that's across the world, that's across time zones and continents and and oceans and seas. We are called to love the people that have a different culture than ours. You know, like Orange County. Um, We are called to... to (laughs) I know, I spent two days this week. I came home and showered. And, uh, you know, you just got to do that. And, uh, um, but we are called to love the Muslim. Can, can I pick which ones? No. No. We're called to love the Hindu. We're called to love the one that wants to take crosses out of every portion of our society here in America. We are called to love. And wow. And folks... Some of us struggle with that. And the only way I know for that to take hold and root and it becomes a practice in our life 
is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because it allows us, by His Spirit, to move into means and places uh, that would not be open to us otherwise. And with those moments, we get to do what God has called us to do. And it takes work and it takes dedication to get there. And another one of our, another one of our goals this year is that in ruin, that which we do for missions, we believe that every one of you can touch missions or can touch ruin in our congregation this year. When you bought a bag of harvest oats, you were being a part of ruin. You were touching something that was going to be used. Because you see, it wasn't only about buying Bibles for our children. It was about buying Bibles for unreached people groups in other parts of the world that have yet to have a Bible in their own language. So we invested an equal amount in Bibles for a, a people group that have yet to hear a clear presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and have scriptures for themselves. And that's what we have done with the money that we've raised. And that's why I think the bidding just went up to a million dollars in that last bag. Because you see, we have a job to do. We have a responsibility. And that responsibility requires that, that we not only would touch ruin, and that's fantastic, but that we would be ruined in the process. That our priorities would be ruined and His priorities would come to the forefront of our lives. Our hearts need a shot of adrenaline. Matthew chapter 25, you can go ahead and turn there in your Bibles, is a... It's an interesting passage of Scripture, and um, it's what we call a, uh, an eschatological passage, or it's talking about the return of Christ, and it's talking about this, uh, it's a picture, uh, well, it's many pictures, this actually, this, this passage of Scripture, oh my goodness, I, I, there is, there's much discussion around this passage of, uh, of Scripture, but we, can, we cannot deny the fact that it is, a, it is a future tense passage. It's talking about the return of Christ. But some people want to make this all about the nation of Israel. Others want to make this about the church and, and, and so on and so forth. And so I'm not going to talk about either of those things. And we're going to talk this way. So let me read the passage to you and then we will look at it. Number one, verse one, I should say. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like the ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish. Five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil and jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and, and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then they all, the bridesmaids, the virgins, they all woke up. And they trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourself. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Now that's, that's, that's another sermon in itself right there. But boy, to be shut out, just, ugh. Later, the others, or the, uh, yeah, the others also came. Sir, sir, they said. Open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth. I don't know you. And this echoes the way chapter 24 ended. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Thus, thinking of the church or Christ's return or the perusia, the returning of the Lord. Now, um, let me give you a little bit of context here. And I'm going to go right down the middle with it. All right. Context here is this parable First of all, in, in, in mixed company, people always snicker when you talk about this parable. They go, <laughs> could they not have found another word? And, but the, the, the word, the picture for us, gives us this look at, at, at the intent of the heart. And it helps us to understand that even in the intent of the heart, the practice does not always follow through. And so we see here that half the room is divided. Half of the room is ready, the other half not as ready as they should be. 
And it's a, it's a picture of readiness. And, and, it's a, and it's to be contrasted with those that are close, but they are still unready or not ready for the coming of the Lord. And it's, it's, a, very, it's a very visible picture. And in this picture, we are taken to the scene of what is to happen in any common village at that time. And these, and these virgins also are bridesmaids, or they can be friends, or they can even be servants of the bridegroom. They are waiting to escort the bridegroom in a torch-lit procession. It's kind of cool, right? And they would light their torches at the end of the ceremony, and the bridegroom and the bride would, would go home. And the lamps are probably torches with with oil-soaked linen or rags wrapped around it, and they would burn for several minutes, and then they would need to be refueled. They would need to be, re- in some cases, maybe even reignited. But without a further supply of oil, they would go out very quickly. And those that were, were, were wanting to be ready would not have torches to burn because the fuel was not available to them, or they had not taken advantage of the fuel that was for them. Now folks, throughout Scripture, oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And, and the anointing that comes on uh, with oil that is very, very uh, symbolic of, of God's Spirit being on someone. I, I, as a kid, I would always kind of, you know, I'd read about David coming in from the field uh, after the prophet had gone through all his brothers and stuff and, and said, no, he's not the one, he's not the one, he's not the one. And finally, do you have any more sons? Yeah, well, there's one out there in the, in, you know, tending the sheep, but you don't want him. No, bring him in too. And I love when, when, the, when the prophet of God just, you know, he pours out oil all over David. And I'm thinking as a kid, gross, right? Like, well, you know, I, I, I shower every day. This has just kind of wrecked what I had planned for my day. I am covered in oil. But the fact of the matter is, it's symbolic of the anointing of the Spirit of God on his life. And it's a setting apart. And it is this moment where, where when you look at oil, and then we come into the book of Acts, and it was like, uh, it was like tongues of flames were resting on them. And when flame reaches oil, something burns. And it consumes us. But I think where we have gotten it wrong is we're always consuming God. In a sense that we're always trying to make and shape God to work after our will. And we're always trying to use His tools to do what we want Him to do. And He says, no, I want to propel, empower, energize your life to do what I have called you to do, what you are responsible to do here on earth. And that is to win the loss and to go to any length in which to do it. And along the way, you're going to love them. And folks, when I think about that, I recognize that... that you know, I, all the, the, the amazing church meetings that have been in my life, and I've seen incredible things... But what I haven't seen enough of is taking that which happened here and putting it into practice into our everyday lives. And that's why I want to challenge, again, I already alluded to this, but I want to challenge you that say you're Pentecostal, then be Pentecostal. Then be that. And in Pentecostal doesn't mean that you wave a hanky in church. That's what it meant when I grew up on Sunday night. You waved your hanky. And the more Pentecostal you were, maybe you had two. And then you went to the airport and you brought the planes in. Because you were practiced. You knew how to do it. But the fact of the matter is we didn't practice it outside the house. Because it was safe in the altar. And it wasn't so safe on the outside. But that's why he says, I want to empower you to do this. I want to see, I want to place a vision in your heart where you see 100 students come to the Lord within a year and you go, we've never seen anything like that before, but you begin to believe the dream that he places in your heart and you just recognize that the Holy Spirit's going to have to do this. And guess what he does? But sometimes we're more worried about in the house about who stole my Honda and who's got my Hyundai. 
And only some of you are going to understand that. The Holy Spirit is meant to move you out there. To love a world that's tough to love. And to reach a world that is really lost. And you know what? When we begin to recognize that perspective... Well, it's, it's coming back to this story. You see, in the story that the bridegroom has not yet returned and they get weary and they're tired and they actually fall asleep. And folks, you can't, you can't, you know, you can't stay awake all the time. But it's this being alert, being ready. And may I add to it here in, in relation to this story, having the vessels filled and ready to go. You see, oftentimes, and I think what has happened within the body of Christ, is we're so focused on us that it's very easy to forget about who's outside. And the vessel, the vessel isn't as full as it should be. Even in verse 3 and 4, the foolish ones took their lamps but did, did not take any oil with them. The wise... However, took oil and jars along with their lamps. They were filled. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10 says, But he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, we take a little bit of liberty here. But my power, power of God, is made perfect in our weakness. Well, without God, you and I are pretty wimpy. There's not a lot. We may rise to certain stature within society, but in light of eternity and everything else, we're still not right before the Lord. And so, when we recognize our need of a Savior, the power of God comes into our lives and we are, we are, set, we are set apart and we are saved. This is the fantastic thing. Every one of us should, should take this invitation because there will, all, there will be some times in our lives where we actually recognize our sense of weakness. But there is also a sense, again, in our own lives, even as those that know the Lord, that there are some things that we hear from Scripture and we go, I'm not capable of doing that or believing that or moving in that direction. And I understand that I get that. But that is a moment of weakness. And when we come to those places where we are saying, I just don't think, then that's a great moment to say, I don't think I can do this, Lord, but I know you can do this in my life to see this happen. And that, again, talking about power. And it is always about not about what you are doing. It's not about spiritual superiority. It's not about being filled with the Holy Spirit and going, I'm a better Christian than you are. It's not that at all. It's about knowing that in one of the greatest needs is in evangelism and missions. Let me tell you how this has played out for us as, as Assembly of God folks. Every, um, every move of God and every movement or denomination that was birthed out of it it's amazing to me how they have something that's very unique about what they're able to do. Now, there was many, what's well, interesting, there, was, there were many groups that were in those same meetings at Azusa Street. And, um, and in those meetings at Azusa Street, we had, we had several, several movements get birthed out of that. One of them was the Four Square. They are the most similar to us in regards to uh, our, our theology and everything else. But I'll tell you what, if I needed to send a missionary, I would not go to the, I would not go to the four square. You know, if I, if I needed to plant a church, I would go to the four square. They are the best church planters in the world today. They are fantastic. They do it better than anyone else. But you know what they don't do well? Missions. They're crummy at it. They just, and they make no bones of it. We're just bad at it. And you know why? Because they go, you're great at missions. And they're right. We are the largest missions sending agency in the world. 
And why is that? Because our story is the book of Acts story that takes this message to the whole earth, to the whole world, to the ends of the earth, because we believe that is our calling, and we accept the power of the Holy Spirit to get that done. And that's what's exciting to me, that God has commissioned us for a very special purpose. And our purpose is to be about seeing people loved into the kingdom of God. It's about going to places where people have yet to know him. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I've got so many other points, but I think I'm going to just leave it there. Let me, let me close with this. As we surrender our yesterday, today, and tomorrow to God, it brings full circle that, that we need to be immersed in what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. Now again, we have spent eight weeks talking about the many facets of how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. This is one facet of how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. I got up again this morning before my feet hit the, the ground, I said, good morning, Holy Spirit, and I'm really tired. Those were exactly what I said this morning. Losing an hour of sleep was, ah, right? But it was still, good morning, Holy Spirit, I'm tired, what are we doing today? And it's just that invitation to be moved by the Spirit. And there are things that He wants to do in our lives that perhaps are not as demonstrative as, as what I am talking about, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit where people are praying Praying in tongues. Acts 19, verse 1 through 7, again, continues our story in the spread of the gospel. And it goes like this. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples. In other words, he found some believers. And he asked them, it's an interesting question, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, what baptism then did you receive? And again, you'll remember John the Baptist. He was making the way for Christ, right? Preparing the way. Uh, John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, and that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Paul placed his hands on him, didn't even think twice about it, it seems to me. And the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and they prophesied. And there were about 12 men in all. What I'm getting at today is that this is a normative pattern in the book of Acts. It's been a normative pattern, actually, not only just in the book of Acts, but even down through church history. Sometimes people go, well, what happened? It seemed, to like, it seemed like the Holy Spirit went on like vacation for hundreds of years. No, he didn't go on vacation. I can assure you that the Holy Spirit very much has been at work since the time of the writing of these words. But in the coming and the prepare, preparation of the, of the return of the Lord, there needs to be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on our lives. Joel's prophecy speaks to this out of Joel chapter 2. You know, we used, to, uh, we used to end every service. Maybe you guys remember this. The Lord could come at any moment, right? Did you, did you guys talk like this in the church you went to? He could come at any moment, right? He come right now. So, you know, if, if you go to that movie and it's R-rated and he comes, you could be left behind. I mean, <laughs> or if you're dancing too close to an Irish dancer, you could miss it. The door could shut, and no spring is going to save you there. Sorry, I had to work in Irish Spring. I had to. I've been trying to get it in for 25 minutes. I found it. We had a lot of fear built into our faith. And I don't know if you know that fear and faith really aren't compatible. I and mean, yet, we had a lot of fear built into our faith. And there are some here today that are even fearful about some of the words that I'm talking about today. And I want you to know that I love and respect what you believe and I want you to love and respect what I believe as well I do believe in this I've experienced it in my life and with it's a great honor to pastor a church where we have different faith backgrounds it makes me a better pastor frankly 
It allows me to understand formation and some things that weren't necessarily a part of the assemblies of God. We were crazy when we started. We were, I mean, we were just like, oh, all you need is the Holy Spirit. Out you go. Where am I going? Wherever the Lord calls you. Well, I think he's going to send us to Tibet. And off we would go, and there would be no training, no, no language, and, and we would just go, well, the Holy Spirit will give us the language. Guess what? He didn't. He didn't. But he did plant seeds. And today, it's interesting to me that the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God is, is a relative to one of the great Tibetan uh, outposts for Christians in the world today. It was planted a long, long time ago, and for many years, about 30 years, there were no converts for Jesus Christ. So sometimes we can't always look at the immediate fruit or the results, but we have to be faithful. But what I'm getting at is, is that the church in Acts and the church today needs to live in readiness and to be able to do that which we are called to do. I know God is calling some of you to some remarkable things. There are young people in this room today that are going to give their lives to serving in the mission field somewhere in the world today. And I got to tell you, if they're going to do that, then I would encourage them to have the power of God in, on them, in them, around them, over them in an amazing way. And never to shy away from what God wants to do because that's where the miraculous happens. Sometimes we become consumed with the arguments for and against whether this experience is even valid today. When I started the series... I also was reading probably three or four other resources at the time, preparing for what I thought would be our last message in this series and, and to give you a basically a blow by blow why you should be filled with the Holy Spirit. Point, 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 argument, 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 point, point, point. And then as I got to about week four and week five, I didn't even finish reading all the books. Because he went, I just went, you know what? I don't think it's the argument anymore. I think it comes down to the fact that we now recognize that we can't do this in our human strength. That we need God. And that we need the power of His Holy Spirit. And this was driven home for me today when I met a young couple. They were like 23 and stupid, you know. And uh, any 23 and stupid in the room? If you are, I'm sorry. We, we have prayer for people like you. And uh, they were, they were 23 and stupid. But man, did they trust God. They're serving on the campus of Fresno State. The Assemblies of God has missionary couples, young couples, that serve on, on campuses, university and college campuses across the nation. And the reason they do that is because, do you know nations of the world send their students to go to schools in the United States? Today, there are at least 25 top leaders, like presidents or dictators of their country that have all been trained in the United States in the last few years. So they are sending their students to come to our schools. They're sending Muslim students. They're sending communist students. They're sending us students. And so we have placed missionaries on campuses to meet these students. Because we believe that if we can influence them when they go back to their country, they will be an influence in their world. And in this young couple, this 23 and stupid couple, they have this incredible opportunity and they have a number of Chinese students and some other, uh, some other Middle Eastern nation students. And you know what? They've just decided they need the power of God. And what's amazing is the power of God is just coming on them with such an amazing ease. They're not arguing about whether it's for today or not. They're just going, I need everything that God wants to give me. And the other day, the young lady was walking up the stairwell at the university, and this one of her students came running up and said, I need the Holy Spirit now! And she was a little bit taken aback, and she, didn't, and she was trying to say, well, listen, we can pray. She goes, I need what we've been talking about now. So right, right here, right here, 
being with all these people right here. She laid hands on her. And that girl was baptized in the Holy Spirit in that hallway stairwell and began to express worship to the Lord in tongues and praying in another language. And God did something in her life. And I don't know the rest of the story yet, but she's one of those students that will be finishing up, graduating this year, and going back to a situation that is extremely difficult and volatile and political in her nation. And she believes that God has called her for a time such as this. Folks, what I'm getting at is there is a time for such as this. Oh, some of you Pentecostals, slow down. Come on, slow down on me. Because again, Pentecostals, if you have not been praying in the Spirit, in your own personal prayer time, you are missing. You are missing so much of what the Spirit of God wants to do in your life. You know, in golf, how do they say it, Bryce? Drive for show, putt for dough. Is that how they say it? Right. And I think, so oftentimes in regards to the Holy Spirit, and this is our failing, it was all about the show. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Remember, it's His kingdom, not our kingdom. Where, where we need to be active, successful, is in loving that person that drives us insane. It's going to the end of the earth to reach those who have not yet to hear. We're going to worship together, and I've gone a little bit long today. Yeah, you're going to have to be because I'm still, still standing here. Here's what we're going to do. I asked uh, Pastor Nick to, to lead us in a couple songs and in closing. And then after we've had a time of worship together, um, we're going to invite people for, for prayer, as we always do. It's, it's, it's our custom we do every week. But some of you will come today and go, I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I, I need that power that you're talking about to do what God is calling me to do, to do what God is calling me to be about in this church. And without big fanfare or everything else, we just want to lay hands on you and pray in that way, okay? And, uh, and some of you are going, oh, I'm still not so sure. Well, then begin to talk to the Lord about this. Say, God, is this, is, this really, is this really true? Does this really work this way? And again, it's not so everyone can be prophesying all throughout church and it becomes a circus and it gets crazy and all this. No. It's so we can get the job done. 134 students have been saved in the youth department this year. That's more than have been saved in this sanctuary this year. Something is out of balance. And I can tell you what's out of balance is the power of God working in our lives. And if we are going to love people, if we are going to be the friendliest place on earth, and if we are going to touch the world with ruin, then we better know the power of God. I'm going to invite you to take out your connection card. I'm not even going to go through it all today. I can't. I don't have time. But if you want to mark off those things as we so often do, and if you're a brand new guest today, if you'd fill out your contact information, the end of the aisle, if you'd reach down, grab that bucket, we are going to receive these cards right now, okay? And if you, you don't have time to fill it out and you've got more that you want to say, then you know what? One of our ushers will take this from you when you need it, right? So some of them look, you know, got jackets on. The only guys that wear jackets are our ushers, and that's amazing. That's great. And then Chelsea's here and others are here. And uh, they'll get these from you if you're still writing them. Stand with me as we worship together. Let's give him our best worship as we sing together. God bless you. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. Thank you. No place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be. Kayla and I have a theory about hand sanitizer that it doesn't really do anything. <laughs> so funny. No place so I'd funny. rather be. Yeah, that's right. No place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be. Than here in your heart, 
There's nothing worth more than could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free. And my shame is under In your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more than could ever come close no thing can compare you're our living hope your presence Lord how many of you have tasted and seen I've tasted and seen the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is in your presence Lord you're welcome here Holy Spirit Holy Spirit you are Glory of your goodness. 
Specifically, we'd like to pray for you in this area. Just because, because, I don't know, just, this would help us, all right? So, because we got some folks that are ready to pray with you and just want to love on you. Others of you have different needs today. You've come with, with maybe a medical emergency or a difficulty with a child or there's all sorts of things that go on. I get it. Our prayer friends will be across here as well, and they are ready to pray for you. And I know Leo's got a heavy heart today because he's thinking about a grandson, but Leo always stands right here, and he's ready to pray with anyone that's ready to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And as if that's someone in this room today, I want you to find your way here. We want to make sure you go home with the Bible today. We want to make sure you understand how this journey with Christ begins and get you going in, in a good direction. Is there anyone in this room today that's ready to take the step with Jesus that you want to accept him into your heart as Lord and Savior? Is that anyone in this room? I'm just taking a quick moment to, to peek around this room. Folks, now you know what we need to be praying about, right? We're making the point. We need to be people of the Spirit. And so, prayer friends, if you'd be up here in this area, those of you that are comfortable, my prayer friends that are comfortable praying with folks, to come into the experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. June is the lead here in this regard. She is, this, this is experience happening right here. And so if, if that's the way you're coming this way, I invite you to come this way. If you want prayer about another matter, we've got prayer friends that are ready to meet you over this way as well today. And for those of you that are heading out this door, know that God has a purpose for what he wants to do in your life today. And so go do that. Lean not upon your own understanding, but stand in that which he is directing you to do. God bless you, folks. I may or may not see you at the door today. I don't know. But God bless you. See you on Wednesday night. Great study in the book of Acts. We'll see you on Wednesday night. Thanks for being here today. God bless you. I'd rather be than here.